we have seen over the past couple of years uh, where we all used Krasotnev, we've kind of based on the J. Alex and Alex trial uh, kind of transition to electinib as the first line state. Do you want to kind of give us your thoughts and summarize that, that data? So, you know, Profile 1014 was the, you know, Krasotnev was actually approved in the U.S. before that, so many U.S investigators never actually enrolled patients on that trial. We were just using it up front based on the mm -hmm. phase one and two data. Um, and so that was the standard of care. And for a long time, um, that's what everyone was using. The Alex data and JLX really set the bar high in terms of the other ALK inhibitors that are currently approved and, and in development. You know, the progression-free survival hazard ratio was 0.42. Um, the uh, progression-free survival update at ASCO, although it was not independent review, it was investigator, mm -hmm. um, was 35 months. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, electinib has become my first-line preferred ALK inhibitor at this time. Um, but we have other drugs out there. We saw data um, at World Lung this year, and you know, seritinib we saw data with uh, a couple of years ago as well. Yeah, so, so seritinib, but very similar, you brought up profile. A trial where crizotinib was compared to chemotherapy, Ascend 4 was uh, seritinib versus ke chemotherapy. V very similar results? I think very similar results in that seritinib was much better in terms of progression-free survival compared to chemotherapy. And I think to a certain extent in the U.S., at least, this trial was somewhat discounted because the, the ALEX trials came out in the comparison right. to the crizotinib. And, and, and in all fairness, Ascend 4 used the old dose, the 750. Yeah. Um, now, now we have a new dose with food, a 450. That was the Ascend 8 data. I think that was the other thing. In the second line experience, most people realized 750 was very hard to tolerate sure. due to GI toxicities and increased liver tests. And many, I think, astute clinicians started at 600 and did some other adjustments empirically, which was not optimal. So they did do a study looking at the food effect, and they really found that 450 was much better tolerated in terms of the GI toxicities, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Yeah. And it, uh, it's actually at this meeting, we saw some data showing that it's a very similar efficacy in terms of response, duration response, and progression-free survival. I think this led to the dose change, mm -hmm. but I think Leora's hit on the critical point. Now, where do we, do we insert in seritinib into our current uh, treatment paradigm, or is it just a, another option uh, at this point? In the, I mean, it becomes more complicated. Uh, you talked about uh, Alex. I'm going to have Max talk about Alta 1L, uh, which was a similar design, brigatinib versus um, uh, crizotinib in out positive patients. And we saw some data at this meeting about the CNS activity. So it's very complicated now. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the ESMO guidelines yesterday, and I saw in first line allowed would be brigatinib, seritinib, and alectinib. <laughs> Both, so we have to decide. Alectinib showed very nice BFS data with nearly three years BFS in frontline. We saw seritinib, but the sequencing will be interesting. And now we saw the Alta 1L one, one, one trial where we compared brigatinib against crisotinib and saw a nearly same hazard ratio like we saw it with alectinib compared to crisotinib. And so we have a new drug coming up and brigatinib seems to be highly effective in patients without brain meds, but with brain meds, it seems to be even better. And so the ESMO, the, the, the brain meds data are really convincing, a hazard ratio comparison to, uh, to crisotinib O to zero. This means a lot, so I think, and it's well tolerated as well as alectinib. You see in, with brigatinib some lab issues, but it's well tolerated easy to give once daily. In comparison, electinib is also well tolerated. You give it twice daily, so it's, but I would say frontline, my best choice in the moment is electinib and will now, when we have the long-term for, long follow-up with brigatinib, I think both drugs will be quite equivalent. Mm -hmm. The sequencing will be then, mm -hmm. should, how can we switch? Right. And, and comment on, I mean, one of the initial concerns that I think is no longer a concern is this early pulmonary toxicity that may be dose-related. Any comments there? So we treated about 60 patients already with brigatinib, and I saw it in one or two patients, really a pneumonitis, especially in the, the pneumonitis in the beginning with, you start with 90 milligrams, and after the x-ray doesn't show, so after a week, no side effects, you increase the dosage to 180. And actually, I just saw it once in my patients and when you just tell, tell the patient when you have a, a trouble, just come into the clinic, it's not a big issue actually. So I think from the 
tolerability, both drugs, electinib and regatinib, are quite comparable. Yeah, and then we and then we saw just an extension of ALK and ROS1 um, uh, at the World Lung meeting. We had a, uh, some data with lorlatinib and entrectinib. Uh, Tom, you want to tell us about that data? So I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for loratinib in the ALK as well as the ROS1 uh, yeah. space. Yeah. Uh, I think I recall the loratinib response rate in ROS1, it was a mixture of cruzotinib previously retreated and as well as uh, treatment naive was around 40%. And um, I think that uh, we're waiting for approval, but I could see this having a role in those patients who progress on crizotinib, and then we'd have an option, right? You need to switch them over. And the intractative data was very, very impressive. Yes. I think that uh, that's another TKI, and it has slightly better blood-brain barrier penetration, building on the theme that, that Max talked about is, you know, our new drugs are going to hopefully prevent brain metastasis rather than uh, wait for them to occur. Leora, it's a, a land of plenty in a patient population we don't see very often. Particularly no. if you're a community oncologist, <laughs> yes. you, may, you may never see, yeah. so, right? The, true. Um, the the intractinib data, though, was in crizotinib naive. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, so the but brain I, the brain med issue is a big one, and so... But I, if I remember correctly, the intractinib data PFS was about 27 months yeah. or something like that. Pretty impressive. Yes, uh, it looked really good. Yeah, um, yeah. And less a, toxic than what we yeah. see with crizotinib, for yeah. sure.